Uh, I could turn my camera around because I was pointing at your elbow. It was actually pointing at your head and had Haley's mayonnaise jar and egg carton. Haley's mayonnaise jar. And I apologize for losing connection again. Okay. Haley's mayonnaise jar. She didn't use Steve's mayonnaise. No, I like these. Okay. That is submission, sacrifice, shoot, not. She Where was I? Right there in that recliner. Where was I in the Bible school? You were talking about standards. Standards. We've got to have standards to live by. But even though each household may have their own standards of some things, don't eat with your elbows on the table, and some of them are cultural things. Some of them are manners. Those are standards. But when we come down to the ethical, spiritual, moral sin, we have the Bible as the standard. The issue is when you take things and say, well, that's not what that means. That's not what it, it's not for today. And you start putting conditions on what the Bible says instead of just living by the Bible. What we're about to read tonight is called the Sermon on the Mount. It's in Matthew chapter 5. Go ahead and find Matthew 5. We're going to be reading in this for probably the next few weeks. Um, we're going to look at what Jesus said. What Jesus said. That does not mean that what Jesus said trumps everything else in the Bible because he is the word of God and he never said anything that's not in total agreement the Bible is in the total agreement but what we have to think about is this is the new covenant Better? you're good one. That's, that's perfect that's perfect I can see that my beard's on straight and everything's great I know Hey, Leticia. Y'all say hey, Leticia. Hey. Hey, Leticia. And Miss Pat. Well, hey, Miss Pat. Yeah. Hey, Pat. Hey, Miss Leticia. Well, she's never been on before. She figured it out. Good girl. Okay, we're studying the Sermon on the Mount and our What is Sin Bible study. Yes. And we're looking at the New Covenant which is what we are under. Now, a lot of times people assume that the new covenant is much easier. It is a better covenant. The Bible says that. But we would assume that it's much easier. You have to do less, and you get more. <laughs> it's a bad diet. Right. I mean, isn't that what people believe, though? You do less, and you get more than the old covenant. The old covenant was a bunch of rules. The new covenant, there's no rules, and you get it all. But that's not what that's not what the new covenant says, is it? So we're going to start, and we're going to see what Jesus said. That is what people said. Now this is the famous section where Jesus said, "You heard it said this, but I tell you this." This is this is repeated several times in this chapter. And as I said, we will we will get to it. So uh, Olivia, if you would read uh, Matthew five one through three. Okay. Amen. So this is why it's called the Sermon on the Mount. They were in the in the cove of a mountain. The uh, place where this is thought to be done was a natural amphitheater, so that he could stand and thousands could hear him speak. 
much like an opera house where an opera singer can be heard without microphones. So this is where the setting takes place. And he begins to teach them, and the first thing he says is, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of, of heaven. So what are the poor in spirit, and what does that mean to us? Humble. I think, I think humble, but I think people who just are not strong. You know, they're just not strong emotionally and spiritually. They're weak in spirit. We don't. We don't. Isaac too. Isaac too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I want to make sure everybody knew it was not him. <laughs> so y'all believe that that's the basically it? Well, yeah, he's tackling the opposite of what he's doing. He's tackling the, the biggest problem in anybody's lives is Christ, and he keeps he's opposite going another direction. I fought that. Well, my cross reference is to Proverbs 16, 19. It says, Better is it to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the school with the proud. So it refers to a speaker that says, Mine cross reference is the Luke 6, 20. It says, And he lifted up his eyes on the disciples and said, Blessed be you, poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. I got another one to look up to. So when she talks about more and more sense, those that are very poor went out to the spirit. So that one person is like the book that comes from here. Here, we'll be the next. We'll see the paperwork, but here it doesn't end the spirit. Another reference is Isaiah 66 2. Isaiah 66 2. Isaiah 66 2. For all things hath mine hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man I will look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. So contrite. Contrite, okay. Humble, contrite, broken. Well, right? I don't know if anybody said broken yet. Broken, but we understand in Christianity that is what what Christianity brings you to. It's not a boldness as the, some people in the church are teaching now. That you have you have you are a king's kid and now you can be walk around with your nose in the air because you have all authority given to you in the heaven and earth and you're and you can just Stomp on the devil and stomp on people that you don't like. and I mean, it's just a real cockiness that they are teaching. This verse goes against that. You know, for a time period, I was involved in that kind of a church. But even then, even then when we were walking in that, it never sat right. Yeah. A child of God should never be cocky and prideful and arrogant. And that's all that you see now. I mean, we don't watch TV, but back when we did, all those televangelists and all that stuff, that's all they were. There was no humility. And you know, I don't think about people like, well, I won't start calling names of the old, I mean like 17, 1800s preachers. I never saw them as cocky and arrogant. And you know, I remember reading about Smith Wigglesworth, who, he was so important. And you know, had that man, I don't know if I ever told y'all about that man, but um, he had kidney stones, and that's what eventually killed him. And y'all, y'all heard how bad kidney stones are? They said he would stand up and preach, and when he was done and he'd go off the stage or the podium, his clothes would have blood all over him from where... Those kidney stones were literally cutting him in two. But he was preaching for hours and bringing revival in these places and never said a word about the pain he was in. Mm. Wow. I can't imagine some of those modern preachers doing that. No. That is humility and that is that is what I mean. That's a past a burden for the for the for lost. The lost. Yeah. Where you really are suffering for those because you're trying to reach them. Not getting up there in your gold watches and Armani suits and all that stuff. Yeah. And well, I think we should strive to be poor in spirit in that way. Yeah. And what and let's let's think about this and all of these that we're about to read. What what was Jesus in this? What was his attitude in this? 
Because we've gotten the misconception that, yeah, Jesus suffered, but we don't have to. Well, Jesus was humble, but we don't have to be. But we're supposed to be more like Christ. Yeah, I don't see that anywhere in Scripture. I mean, even though he, he did pay the cost, I don't see where we have the freedom to walk around like king's kids. Right. You know what I mean? Right. I mean, I can see that in some light, but to know where we, who we are, but in the same light know that we are so far from God, and we could, and on our best day, we're not even half, not even an ounce of what he was. No. And and if you look at the early church, the disciples, all the martyrs that we read about every week, if you look at all of that, nobody had a prideful attitude. Right? right. They were all broken. They all, even before the kings, when they were being sentenced, did not argue back. Right. They didn't they didn't try to defend themselves because he didn't. And we're we're a, a a long way from that. We are so removed from that kind of attitude. But that's what we that's what we hope to learn in this is what what the attitudes as I've heard this taught on the beatitudes of this is attitudes that we're supposed to be. Uh, okay. You know, I was reading through this morning. I can't find nothing. I can read it. I read this morning about the uh, the, the pumpkin and the uh, Pharisee that's the temple of praise. This is the parable about how the the, the uh, Pharisee stood there and he said, said how good I am and that. But the pumpkin said, you know, have mercy on me. And Christ said, you know, who who do you think had was, was forgiven? I think it literally says he prayed to himself. Yep. And that's what he's talking here. It's very spirit. Be humble. Right. And know, who, know what you are. Amen. Amen. Okay, so, poor in spirit. You're going to make notes. Okay, Haley, if you would read number four. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Amen. All right, so what is what is this one? Well, in my own personal experience, every time I get into a moment where I'm mournful, the Lord reveals scripture or a promise or some, some reminder of what He has done for me and, you know, and gives me hope. Amen. I mean, that's just, that's just well, maybe maybe we should back up and discuss what blessed means or blessed. Well, I want to I want to stay focused on our topic, which is what is sin. So maybe as we go through these, you can point out where you feel like this is addressing sin. Okay. You know, as I was also put it as one of those type things, it's like, and I heard, uh, I can't even heard preachers, they didn't say that. Like, we're talking about how, if, it's, if we have a, a nice, easy life with no problems like that, also we have, pro- we have problems spiritually, because we, we will ever have a nice, easy road if we live in Christ. The world will hate us, the devil will hate us, and all things come in our lives. Mm-hmm. And I, I guess, guess what he said here is this, you know, we're more for those problems, we're more for those issues, and we'll, you know, I guess you see more and more less being got like sign or heaving, you know, pretty much just exhaustion. I'm tired of being tired and worn out. And uh, I think that, you know, by trials we worth it. Mm-hmm. We'll, we, will, we will mourn now, we'll cry now, we'll have to deal with it, the hard times now, but the good times are coming. Yeah, it's good to come for it. Amen. By the way, I guess when we look at this word sin, though, is how how are we being afflicted? Are we being afflicted? Are we having a nice easy road and everybody loves us and, you know, the world don't care about us and none of that happens to us? Because I guess you take the opposite. If you laugh now, 
that we're reading through if we're looking at what is sin we have to consider that these are things that we're supposed to be and if we're not we're sinful so we're supposed to be we're supposed to be poor in spirit we're supposed to be mournful we're supposed to be meek why would we need to be mournful well, I mean, there's times in your life you're going to be mournful, but should we seek after mourning? Well, I think that he wants us to be mournful of the things that that are there. This is an example. You have somebody that you, you're connected with, a sibling, a child, a parent that does not know Jesus. You can just put them off in your mind. You can just forget about them. But if you mourn for that person and pray for them to be saved, then, like David praying for his child that was dying, and then when the child died, he he didn't mourn anymore. And they said, well, wait a minute, you've got it backwards. You're not mourning now that he's gone. And he said, you can't bring back the dead. Right? But you mourn for those that are lost. And we, we've lost that as the church. We've lost the fact that huge majority of population are going to hell and we don't mourn about that but we should be yeah so i think that we're supposed to be i think we're supposed to be mournful of things that are that, that should make us sad they should break us they should keep us humble my computer just decided to cut off an update Okay. Uh, Sarah, number five. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Read it again more slowly this time. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Okay. The meek. Does this sound like a haughty, arrogant, gun toting, rebelling, Christian? No. Doesn't, does it? One that pushes their rights. This is my right to do this. No. Danita and I was talking about this concept of meekness the other day. Because mm-hmm. I was telling her how I always felt like Philip was a great definition of a meek person. But she was saying how a lot of times people mistake meekness as weakness. And that is not the definition. (laughs) You know, that's an incorrect viewpoint of meekness and being humble. You know, doesn't doesn't mean that they're weak by any means. So that's something... I don't know, it just stood out to me when we were talking about that the other day. That's right. Okay. Well, that's, if you, that's a good point because most people who are meek have it all. They don't say anything about it. They have what? They have it all. 
<laughs> I mean, if you think about it, if if we are, if we really believe that we have it all from Christ, we should be meek. Because we do. We, what, what, could, what could change? What, what is ours to boast of? What is ours to, you know, just talk, of, you know, <coughs> to be proud of? Because it's all Christ. But then again, I think that's why I think the people, you know, you, I talk, I talk, I talk, I talk, it's false being a uh, black white karate. Who would do that? If you want to tell anybody, no. But yet, you know, he can take care of it. I think that's almost, almost a little maturity is when you're meek, when the things don't bother you, when you don't take it, you don't have to show yourself off. You know, it's like when you, and if you're like, you think you're, you're becoming some chance to show everybody anything you do and makes them look really good. But the truth is, a, a true master doesn't have to do that. A master of black doesn't have to take it out of his way to prove that the master black He'll care if you do, care or not. He can do it. Hmm. But bet. on top of that, they also. <laughs> With, even knowing that they have full confidence in who they are, they also know the other side of, I'm not perfect. Yep, exactly right. I, I'm, yes, I am a son of God, but I'm not worthy to be a son of God. So there's that balance there, I think, too. We'll make that straight. I want to tell you emotions. We talk with our hands. I think y'all are absolutely right. You know when you have been in the presence of a meek person. You just know it. Yeah. It's hard to describe the person like that. But yeah. One of the, I mean, one of the things I think about is uh, um, what was the Catholic sister who was Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa. I think about her. I mean she was world known. World known. But she probably was the least pushy person on the planet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Aaron number six. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Hungering and thirst, thirsty for righteousness. Well, what's righteousness? Without sin. Well, <clears throat> I should bring my strong. <laughs> I have it right here. You do? I'm going to cross over to James 1. Uh, if you like wisdom, lay the of God, and that giveth to all men liberally, and abraith not, it shall be given them. So the opposite of that, the sin part would be if you think you've already attained it all. Yeah. You know, the before we before we learn we have to recognize we don't know anything. There's right. actually a good article on a beekeeping page that I read in its entirety to Angie last night. It was a person that's got this beekeeping journal and they're they're actually very um, deep in beekeeping the down to the level of proteins and and things that bees need for their diet down to the biological standpoint the chemistry standpoint of honey um, all this kind of stuff but this person wrote this excellent article that was about first year beekeepers and then second and third year beekeepers and this and they didn't divulge how long they had been beekeeping, but obviously many, many years, maybe 10 or 20 years. And they said every first-year beekeeper was obvious. They asked the questions because they don't know. They, um, they make mistakes. But they said every second- or third-year beekeeper knew everything. 
that if that they had an answer, if you asked them a question, they would tell you point blank this is the way it is. But then they then the person said there was a remarkable thing that took place after the third or fourth year, and that was you realized you didn't know anything. <laughs> you realized that if you ask ten people in a room, should I use a coin excluder, you get ten different answers. No, yes, sometimes, always, only during certain times of the year, only during this condition, only in this condition, and and everybody has got so many different answers by the fourth, fifth, sixth year, you realize it's all variable. It's all dependent on, right? And it, and it, I thought about the Christian walk and what a clear picture it was that you really go through a cycle where you realize you don't know anything. You realize you're so far from God. You realize I'm just, I'm just a speck. I'm just starting. And you know that's what that's what God wants us to be. He wants us to be hungry and thirsty after righteousness. But if you've already gotten there, you're lying to yourself. You know? Isn't it funny how you can take and you can compare these, this, these first six, the first couple of here, I guess, first, the first four, four of these, what Jesus Christ says here, compared to the minutes, and you're already in sin four times. Yeah. Because, I mean, we don't get to that point and think that way, but he says, Blessed is a hunger and thirst of righteousness. That, that goes into our thirst of our being and what we want. As being righteousness, not, and, and yeah, I think I can't I can't find it, but that that, check, that verse that says the natural man of sin is not things of God, and how even right here, as this, even right in this first verse, it's already impossible to be sinless without Christ, because we don't we don't see we don't want things of God. Yeah. Right. Amen. I don't know if people are commenting because I keep, you know, they may be commenting. Let me see if I can find that. Oh, okay. People have been commenting right and left. I know. I can't. Y'all, I'm trying to get logged back in so I can see. Johnny Carroll and... What are they saying? Uh, seems to me the basis of the Beatitudes is of course Jesus plus his humility we should be humble in all these ways circumstances and so forth um, he must increase he must decrease we must decrease he must increase as John the Baptist said two minutes ago they said that I don't know why it's not letting me get on okay um Andy, if you'd read number seven. Bless the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. <clears throat> There's something mature about being merciful, even if you see it in a child. You know, when you see children playing together and one has done the rest of them wrong, and then the natural thing would to be would to retaliate. But you see one that says, let's let it alone. He made a mistake. And say, so that kid's more mature than the rest. You know? So it's, it's, it's part of maturity and growing to be merciful. When we saw the, uh, the Amish children that were killed, and that man killed himself, and the entire Amish... Uh, community came forward and said, you know, we forgive him, we forgive the family, we don't hold anything against him. And there was no animosity whatsoever. Those people showed something to the world, didn't they? I had somebody ask me one time, how, how can you forgive someone who has done nothing to you but hurt you and done wrong by you? How can you forgive that person? And you can't. You can't. You have to find something different inside of you, and that is Jesus Christ.
Angie, number eight. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So you have to be pure in heart. What does that mean? Our Bible says sincere. Sincere. Not having that inner hate. I'm going to be nice to you and I'm going to forgive you, but really I'm not. I'm being, I don't like you. Mm. Well, it's not impossible to not cross. If you use the word as pure as being pure, you know, we know the Bible says the heart's desperately wicked. wicked. So it is one of the impossible to not cross. Not cross, you can't have a pure heart. You have no chance in it. Sorry, it was pointing at the ceiling again. Amen. And then I'm going to read number nine. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. So we have to be willing to, to be peacemakers. Now, you as parents know what that means. You know, you've made peace with your children before. What about peace between you and somebody else? Do we understand that? That's hard, isn't it? You know, we're getting into things that are a lot harder than just don't kill, just don't steal. You know? Do y'all agree? Yeah. So what about in the middle of confrontation? And, you know, the other day I was looking up or thinking about the meaning of confrontation and, you know, that, that gets such a negative, there's such a negative view of confrontation <laughs> that people think if you're confronting somebody about something, that doesn't necessarily mean there is a problem. You're just discussing something, you know. And a lot of times when, you, when you're when you trying to discuss something to work a situation out, you know, a lot of people want to say, you know, let's just, let's just let it go. Let's just not discuss it. You know, obviously, in my opinion, there are certain things that you can let go and certain things you can't. But then you have to come to that point where you just either agree to disagree and you make a, de a decision there. But what about what a, what about when people? You see, I don't know if I make any sense. The P saying, "Well, let's just make peace when you haven't dealt with the situation." Does that make sense? Okay, okay. <laughs> Sometimes it makes sense up here, and I don't get it. Out. <laughs> yeah, um, people. People quite often don't want to be challenged or questioned because they believe they're right. It's a pride thing. And if you are trying to, you know, your word was confront, which sounds harsh, mm -hmm. but discuss is really what you do, I know, in that you're discussing something that is going on. Um, you don't confront your children or confront your sister. You discuss things and you work through that. You negotiate. You compromise if you have to. But in those in those situations, it can be it can appear the most gentle person to be abrasive. Jesus was trying to help the Pharisees. He was being firm with them. But Jesus didn't want them to go to hell. They were not his enemies. Any of those, had they turned and had an open heart, would have received salvation from him. But they were so stuck in their laws and being in charge and, and being right that they could not have done that. Um, we, have to, we have to make sure that we're peacemakers in those situations. Um, 
take Ellie's trying to take it from him. Even if we have to assume the wrong, do y'all agree? Even if we have to take the pain or take the wrong. That's the better choice. What do you mean? Are you saying that in in that situation it is better to just take the wrong? I won't say better, but I think we're supposed to if the other person does not see. I think that we are we as mature Christians very often have to be the one to take the wrong. Okay. Hang on, let's just back up a notch here. Because I think, I think the way you're saying that and the way it's going into her ears is two different things. Okay. I don't, we're not to take the wrong in that way. But there does come a point in time where it becomes evident that the other party is not going to receive sound doctrine. In that point, it is time for us to stop. So in that way, we take, we step back, right. not releasing right. into it. We're not giving in to a false thing, right? But we have to stop ourselves from pursuing the point, right? Because there is that not correct. Yes. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, and I read through this, and I got to the part about turning the other cheek, and those kind of things, and that's what I was talking about. And I'm maybe getting way ahead of us, but. Well, I mean, the way you, you're saying that, or what you're saying, I I think that that's the way it should be too. Yeah. But I just, you know, I just I know that so many times when people have a difference of opinion, instead of focusing on staying both humble parties, knowing that the other person is not trying to attack, but you know, nine times out of ten, it's not received that way. And people on the outside look, well, she's just stirring up trouble. She's just she's just constantly having a problem because she don't like you or whatever, you know, which is not the case at all in my, for me, but, you know, maybe it's for other people. I, the scripture that said, how can two walk together unless they be in agreement is very pertinent to this situation because you cannot speak a language the other person doesn't understand and then accept whatever you're saying. You have to speak to an equivalent party. So when you're speaking to an ultra immature person, they will rear up if you call them immature, but you may know that they are. So when they don't receive it, what you're trying to express it's better not to get angry, but just to think to yourself, they're not ready for me yet. They cannot grasp what I'm trying to express. It's hard not to get angry in those situations when you see them progressing in a worse situation toward other people. And I don't know the answer to that because the truth of it is I tend to get angry myself. I know, shocking. John and Carol said, we have to stand firm on God's word no matter what. After the word has been stated many times, it may be best to stop talking about it, not add fuel to the fire the other person is wanting to fan into That's right. a yelling match. Absolutely. Yeah. I know you've got to work with people who will do it. You know, I know several people like that who, you know, you, who would, would argue with it just to argue with the law, and so they draw you and make you mad. Right. And that's what you have to take and have, make peace on the go and let them deal with it. You know, if, they, if it means they don't think they're right, they don't think they're right. You know, you have to... And let me say something about forgiveness at this point, because we're talking about being a peacemaker. We know the scripture, we studied it before about where Jesus said you had to forgive or you wouldn't be forgiven. And... There was not conditional, you forgive if that person apologizes. You you just have to forgive them. But the old statement of forgive and forget is not in the Bible. There's nothing in there about forgiving and forgetting. Just let it go. Just let it go. I believe that, this is my personal interpretation, that I believe that we are supposed to be harmless 
as doves, but wise as serpents. So in that, we have to consider someone who has... Uh, okay, let me just pull, a, pull something out of thin air. A person who has been in prison as a sex offender for abusing children, they move to your neighborhood. Are you supposed to forgive them? Yes, but do you, are you supposed to forget everything of the past? I say no. I say you're supposed to watch that person like a hawk around your children. Because we are still humans and yes. we still live in our flesh. Yes. 90% of the time. Yes. And just because they served time in prison and just because they say their their lives have been changed, I can show you a new story after new story where those people came out and did it all over again. So I say you better be cautious. And being cautious doesn't mean being unforgiving. No. It's wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. Yes. You have wisdom from Christ. It is not sin to keep some sort of safe space between yourself and those who would harm you. Mm -hmm. And whether that's physically, emotionally, or spiritually. There are spiritual people who abuse you spiritually Mm -hmm. if you allow them to. Just like somebody could abuse you physically. They can, and, but there again, we have to all, Jesus, Jesus, we have to always keep in our forethought too that we wrestle not with flesh and blood. That's right. It's not, it's not really the people, it's the spirits working, and I'm not talking about demons and all that, although they do work. Ellie just almost stepped on Charlie's head, so that's why we all stopped for a second. Uh, John Carroll, back up what you're saying that should be agreeing with the Lord by living your life in Him before others. The others have been heard and seen God's word and ways and now have no excuse. That right there is the key. Say the last little bit. The others have been heard and seen God's word and ways and now have no excuse. Yes. You walk in Christ, you walk in holiness, you do the right thing. Your life speaks more than your words ever will. And this 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 verse here, anybody around that person may not know they're so hard headed, they might so good but anybody around sees. Amen. So You know them by their fruit. Amen. And everybody, everybody sees who will live and who did the right thing. It's obvious, and while we may think sometimes they don't, they do. Right. They do. Right. I like the uh, the Indian parable about the the young brave that picked up the rattlesnake that was in the snow because it could barely move, and he brought it down to a lower elevation where it was warm, and it warmed up in the sun. It beat him, and the and the uh, he said, why did you bite me? I, you know, I brought you down here where you're warm. And he said, you knew I was a rattlesnake when you picked me up. Wow. You know, we often want like people to change, then they're, and we really inside know they're not changed. Right. But we think that this says we're supposed to carte blank, carte blanc, give them. Right. And, and uh, when it says if somebody... You know, strikes you on the cheek, give them the other one also. That doesn't mean you go into a room where you know a bunch of people are waiting on you uh-huh. and you offer them the first cheek. Right. No. I don't know. We've got we've got a lot of this stuff that we've not thought through. Not my story with the chipmunk. I saved it from the cat because they were trying to kill it. It bit me out through it. You threw that little chipmunk. <laughs> Tell me that was reaction and not intentional. I think it was react. Well, no, I don't know. I was I was probably about uh, ten. But I was mad because it was I saved it and it bit me. You knew it was a wild animal. That's what I'm saying. That's like my story. 
Well, tell the truth now. Do you feel bad about I didn't feel bad about throwing it, but it shouldn't have been too funny when Charlie bites her one day. Charlie will never bite me. Well, he has. Chess, I mean. Well, you know, I think another thing to keep in mind is a lot of times, not Olivia, obviously, you just said it, but, you know, we have to remember that we're not supposed to be spiteful. You know? Right. I'm not spiteful. She's not talking about you. We should we should react with mercy and grace and understanding even if we were injured. You know we I know exactly what you mean because we can almost reach a point where we have walked in mercy and we're peacemakers. And you know we're seeking, we're hungry, hunger and hungry and thirsty for the righteousness of God, and all these things we just studied, and yet we get to a point where you just got on my last nerve, and now I'm toggled over the other side, and I'm Tasmanian devil that you don't want to mess with, and we feel justified in that. That way, yes, it's very hard not to be that way yeah. when you have held your tongue or you have you know endured. Mm -hmm. See, at, at this point, you you have to, I think the Lord deals with us in stages because in maturity, you re hopefully reach a point where you don't just come right back at them, but you're still doing it in your heart. Yeah. And for the next three weeks, every night you go to bed at night, you're still having that same conversation and you get some zingers off on them. You know what I'm oh, saying? Yeah. You come right. up with everything that you should have said, but you've reached a point of maturity that you don't say it, but you're still thinking about it. Yeah. The but ultimate goal is to, is to get yes. where you're not even thinking those things See, later the on. The Lord has We're been all really dealing with me. With oh. that. You know, he really has been bringing that to my mind because I there's something you said one time I will never forget as long as I live. It was in one of those moments with with a, a certain group of people that we were having a, not a good time with, and you you looked and you said, in the end. They are going to go to hell. And it doesn't matter what anybody does to us. If the bottom line is they're going to go to hell. If right. they do not choose to follow God. Now I'm just talking about a different of opinion on. Right, it was You know, if it's sprinkled or not. But, you know, that should be the bottom line in our heart. What we base everything off of is we can, and we can be the person to just kind of kick them over the edge, you know? You're, You're right. right. Don't push. But You're right. But we have to keep that in the back of our mind anytime there's a differing of opinion or somebody hurts us, whether intentional or not. Right. That our response should draw them to. To God, you know, and not away from it. Right. We need to see the eternal perspective. Uh -huh. That's what we need to be looking at. Um, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> fool me, fool me once, yeah, I'll do it again. <laughs> well, we we know that the biggest thing that keeps people out of church is the ch the people say, well, that it's full of hypocrites. They say one thing and they live another. So we know we have to make sure if they're testing us, if they're pushing us and pushing us and pushing us and slapping us in the face, that, that we don't reach that point where we go over the edge and we retaliate. Because there is a point when they won't be able to handle it anymore. There's a point, when you read the martyr's mirror, there's a point where... Someone was brutally tortured and killed, and the people that did it broke down and were saved. Because they said nobody could go through this unless there's something different about him, and I don't know that. You know, the other thing to watch this time, too, is false modesty. I 
mean, and I, I'm, I'm guilty of that way else. So, and then taking it and you know, I'm back, <laughs> I'm a true <trendy. laughs> <laughs> And that, that's as wrong as Italian backbone. Because you right. get the four, are you your co workers? I'll aim this yet because he's been done. That's what I mean. I thought a false bottom. You take it and then stand back around and say, I'm a more mature than I can take. Uh, you're, you're a little kid. You argue as a boss. And you go out and buy the bottom back and that's over after he leaves the home and say, I look like that. I, I eat And you can be, you can be false mature in this type of thing and actually you're not mature. You think you are just because you shut your mouth. But you're not good for that purpose. I mean, that's not practical. Yeah. Yeah, that is so true, Andy, and I appreciate you bringing that up. It's so true, though, and because we do it all the time. Because that is the only way you to be a bunch of patience, and you're showing patience and not, truthfully, uh, tempting yourself to be a peacemaker or being a, being godly, you're just, just that type of person who's patient with that kind of thing. It's, you know, Bring me that baby. Just so happy. Bring you to me. So it's like, okay. Oh my goodness, don't we do it though? We think, oh honey, you just keep talking. I know better than you. Come here. Oh, uh, Libby, did we get back around to you? Which up? If you would read 10 through 12, Libby. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you. And persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Mm -hmm. Let me do the next one too, because it's kind of tied in. Tw uh, set through twelve. Oh, rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the tried to set through twelve before you. Yeah. So persecuted for righteousness' sake. Not persecuted by like a sickness. Right. Or You're like, persecuted because of living right, standing for what's right, and I'm going to show you this first to show how holy you are. The truth is, you like you being persecuted because you annoying or because you're not or because you know you don't know what you're talking about and you think you do or. Play how cool you the first say, I'm being persecuted for God, and truth be told, no, you're being, you're a laughing stock. Please don't uh, 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 Yeah, there are a lot of people that want to. They read this passage and they automatically say, I already know I'm doing right, so I must be persecuted somewhere. Then they start looking for the persecution. Then they start manufacturing persecutions. They start coming up with things that, you know, oh, then I'm getting a chip on my shoulder because I know I'm persecuted, and Andy, he shut me off the other day when I was speaking. And we get this offense going, and we, oh, well, that's just my persecution. I mean, we, we get to... Growing all this junk in our minds about persecution. You know, we're not talking about you're standing on the street corner in front of an abortion clinic and you're talking to young ladies that are coming in there about to have an abortion or thinking about it and you get arrested. Did you hear me? Yeah. We're not thinking along those lines. We're thinking of, he hurt my feelings. She made me mad. He embarrassed me. You know, dumb things. And we think we got persecuted. And that's not what he's talking about, is it? No. Although Haley got persecuted the other day. Now I'm thinking I didn't respond like I should have. But that's okay. Because you still held to Christ. You know, we can always double and triple think ourselves later on. And the truth is, we grow from every experience. But the persecution will become worse. 
I know Letitia. Letitia, are you still with me? I know Letitia gets a lot of flack up there when she, you know for her choices in her dress and all of that and things that she's doing. She gets a lot of flack from it. And I, I, I pray for her regularly mm-hmm. that the Lord will su- sustain her. Because you know, you never know where it's going to come from. And we've got to we've got to keep our head up and keep walking toward Christ, Amen. and not let that stuff slow us down. Amen. I think I think more than anything that that upsets me is when I see somebody head down the walk, firm in what they believe, and and you know, convinced of their conviction. And at the first little bump in the road, they throw it all away. And we've seen that a lot lately in people that we've been connected with. And it's, I, I think I just get so, I want to I wanna get out the martyr's mirror and say, okay, they ripped the flesh off of this man's body while he was still alive, yet he did not turn back. And somebody laughed at you at the mall the other day. Let's think about the ramifications of what we're doing. Let's think about the big picture. Yeah. We need to hold on and not give up. Because yeah. it is sin. It is sin when you make a decision about something for the Lord and you let something stop you. I, I don't, I, there's no other way to put it. I mean, do you think I'm right or wrong on that? You're right on that. I'm thinking about the scripture. I think it's in Isaiah, Isaiah where he said... If you stumble when you walk with men, how will you ever run with horses? Isn't that the truth? Come on, pull up your big boy panties and mm-hmm. let's go on. Mm-hmm. It really is ridiculous. Mm-hmm. The martyrs suffered the most horrendous thing. Yeah. But we get oh, somebody chuckles at us or takes a picture of us on their cell phone, and we just we just can't handle it. It's so stupid. And it is sin. It is absolute sin. About such petty things, too. I mean, I think about how many times people were, like, staring at me because of my dress or head and I just wanted to go, like, you're staring at you. Know? <laughs> and yet, that should not be this response. You know, I should have walked, you know, if they passed me or you want us, you know, that taking that opportunity to share the love of God and not... Right not think those petty things but you know when you were saying that, I was thinking about you know he likens us to soldiers and and we want to be soldiers for Christ but soldiers endure hard hardships you know That's right. but it's like sign me up to be a soldier for Christ but don't let me get hurt I can't get too hot I don't want to wear these heavy boots you know I don't have to stand out in the sun right. you know I don't endure any um, anything that's going to be hard for me. Or uncomfortable. Or uncomfortable, you know. And what is that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, out of our comfort zone. And, and it really is sin when it boils down to it. For us to assign this perfect situation. I mean, it's a rebellion against the Word of God. Yeah. We've probably got enough time to finish this last, the last uh, three verses. Haley, if you'd read 13 through 16. And remember, we're looking at what is sin. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has, have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out, to be trodden underfoot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Amen. So if we're looking at what is sin... Okay, if I said, this is the only part of the Bible, I want you to tell me what is sin. What is sin? By this scripture. Olivia? 
Not fulfilling your purpose. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Not fulfilling your purpose. Everybody agree with that? That he wants us to fulfill our purpose, and he wants us to be different, doesn't he? He, he created us to be special and different and unique and set apart from the world for something else. Now, we are often compared to the elements in the tabernacle of the, Holy, of the Old Testament. Y'all remember that? He talks about things in the Old Covenant or Old te- Tabernacle that we are compared to. And there would have been a brass bowl. There would have been a candle or a, a light that would have lit the way. And everything in it was holy, wasn't it? Those things were special. Those things were never to be taken and sold in a junk store or a thrift, thrift store or a yard sale. or You know, those things were... One of a kind. Those things were unique. Right. For those devices to be choosing themselves to be, I don't want to be in this tabernacle anymore. I want to be a light in a bar. <laughs> yeah. You know, I want to be a bowl that holds chocolate ice cream. I don't want to be a bowl that holds the holy anointing oil. I want to be the bowl that holds chocolate ice cream. Because I really like chocolate ice cream. And I can still be holy because God said He made me special. But I'm choosing what I'm going to hold. I'm choosing my purpose. And when we do that, when we look at this passage, you're the salt of the earth. What if that salt said, you know what, I don't want to season meat. I don't want to preserve anymore. I don't want to heal wounds anymore. I want to be, I want to be used for art. I feel artsy. I want you to take some Elmer's glue and put put it on a piece of paper and put some salt in it. Or use it to make some salt dough for children to make Play-Doh, right? Right. But that salt is not for that purpose. Right? So when you look at these things, the light on a hill, a city is set on a hill, cannot be hidden. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. Whoa, there's that ugly word again. Good works. Works. And glorify your Father which is in heaven. So people are supposed to see our what? Good works. Good works. And in doing so, the light shines, doesn't it? That's right. What else is it doing the works? What do I think about this? No, but we're supposed to do them afterwards, right? We're supposed to do it. I know that. I only got it just. <laughs> 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 you know, he, he gives, all these are absolute stuff. And yeah. if, you, if you look at them, there's, there's no, I mean, salt, that's not saying ha- it's good for nothing. You can have half the salt. And saying a saying it can't be hid. Now, well, can can be possibly built kind of side where he kicks all the time. Uh, and it does seem to put like that's a good line of wood. It might pass up. There's no part of here. It, it's either there or isn't. Hmm. And so it cannot be hid. It's not possible. Uh, a lot of people want to want to draw that line, you know. Well, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll be I'll be able to see me from one direction and the other side direction. You can't see my city. You know, when I get for our church, you know, uh, it's not, it's, 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 Baby. It's delayed, so you'll have to hold him up there. Uh, Elizabeth Cheryl just showed up, and we're about finished. Sorry, Elizabeth. We've missed you. Hey, Grammy. Uh, fortunately, we're no, recording no. these, right? Yeah. Um, when you stop broadcasting, we have to do the recording. Okay. Look at Paul Isaac. Look at Paul. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Paul! Oh, oh. He's scared me. Yeah, I do. Oh. oh.
Well, we've got, we're about to get into the, the more, we're getting, we're about to get into the passages where it's more cut and dry, do and don't. Yeah. You know? We're about to get into where Jesus said, you've heard it said this, but I'm telling you, this is sin. Right. But I'm glad that we got through this first part and didn't skip that and go right into the other because sin is failing to do what God said. That's right. That's the bottom line. Is sin is failing to do what God said. That's right. So that's how we define it. Um, so next week we will pick back up with verse 17. We're in Matthew 5, verse 17. Andy, will you close us in prayer, please? Heavenly Father, we just ask that you just touch us with what we've read. You just apply our hearts, Lord. Just let it burn our hearts up and do the next week, next week, Lord. Let us see something when our lives we sin for and trust one way to be holy, Lord, and not sin against you, Lord, and throw your word. Just bless us and keep us in your will. Amen. Amen. Don't do anything weird on there yet. Uh, Elizabeth, we missed you, but we're, we'll be glad to see you next week. Letitia, we keep praying for you. Pat Willis says, hi, Charlie, I love you. Charlie says, hi, back. You said, hey, Grammy, are you? Carolyn, John, we love you a million. We love y'all. Um, Erin? Glad you got to be on, Miss Pat, and you figured it out. Stop awesome. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, he is. He is so happy. He's been chewing on my chin. Elizabeth said she would watch afterwards. Oh, we're going to record it, and uh, and it'll be on there for y'all to watch and go back over. I hope that uh, that it was clear because I kept getting a an error message that said low bandwidth or bad network connection or Usually something. it just will get scratchy on the video or something. Okay. But anyway, when you stop broadcasting, it will ask you and then you'll have to type in a title. Okay. So just, um, we love you guys. Bye.